company, um, there's been a lot going on, frankly, since, <laughs> since the last time we all spoke. Um, mm -hmm. Dramatic couple of years, you moved the company to Amsterdam, you briefly, or perhaps still, became the political poster child for inversion. Mm -hmm. um, then you survived a hostile bid by Teva for your company, um, and in part because of some laws that were specific to the Netherlands that allowed you to, to uh, name board members that then voted mm -hmm. against the deal. Um, why did you do that? I, I'm tired listening to everything that you just said. <laughs> I'm just getting the started here. <laughs> um, you know, what's interesting, I'll go back a couple, several years ago and had a lot of conversations up on Capitol Hill saying there's an unlevel playing field in our country. The tax code, the way that we really penalize uh, U.S.-based companies, and in at least our sector, the healthcare sector, which has had hyper-competitiveness and activity in the M&A space, we were the last kind of standing U.S.-based company. And so I'm competing against companies that so have 5% tax. So just to be clear, you're talking about what? in the generic space? Yeah, specialty pharmaceutical. We literally were the last one still in the United States. And so I'm competing against companies that have 5% tax rates that can have a much uh, you know, larger balance sheet to be able to compete for assets. It, it huge disadvantage. And, you know, unfortunately, Congress, there was no signs of Congress doing anything soon. So we had continued to say we weren't going to do just a deal to do an inversion. However, if the opportunity presented itself, we would. And so when we acquired Abbott's generics business, their established products throughout Europe, it gave us the opportunity to uh, invert, and we did. And, you know, yes, it became part of the perfect storm. Um, but and, your, and your dad, who is a senator... <laughs> Uh, from West Virginia did, in fact, oppose this before he didn't. He didn't see didn't. the light in the beginning. Unfortunately, <laughs> I think, like many, you know, it's a, it, you can have a sound bite. I always say don't let the facts get in the way of a good story. Um, <laughs> but the reality is, the reality is, is that we need to remain competitive. And when I said, you know, Dad, we have 5,000 employees in Morgantown, West Virginia. We're one of the largest employers in West Virginia. I said, I can guarantee you, if we don't protect ourselves, no one's going to protect those jobs and the other jobs that we want to grow here in the United States. So perversely, it seems counterintuitive that we needed to invert to grow here in the United States, which is exactly what we're continuing to try to do, is, it, even with our most recent uh, acquisition target of Perigo. Okay, so let's, in one second, move on to that. But <laughs> But beforehand, one of the byproducts of this inversion was that you, there was a little-known law in the Netherlands called Stichting, I think I got that right, which uh, helped... Became the favorite word on CNBC in the last yeah, yes. three months. Um, this concept, or this rule, basically allowed you to oppose the takeover, even though a lot of Wall Street really wanted you to go forward with the deal. Mm -hmm. And now there are a couple of shareholder lawsuits around that. Um, it, did they just not do their homework and not understand that this was part of the situation? I will say this. For all of my years in, in corporate America, I continued to be shocked at, I think, how unprepared many that stay very superficial and I don't think really understand um, until, until there's a fire, until there's a crisis that people then have to dig deep. What I would say and what you know, I got a lot of airtime. Is we were we were a Pennsylvania corporation since the the early 70s, and Pennsylvania, as some may know in here, is a stakeholder state versus a shareholder state, and all that means is that shareholders are an extremely important stakeholder, but we can take other things into consideration. What's in the best of the company, the employees, that, but so it's one of many, and. Unlike Delaware, that's where many companies have ended up domiciling, is very shareholder driven, um, which means price kind of trumps everything else. When we were when we were inverting, you know, we did a lot of homework and looked at a lot of different countries because we had the opportunity to really domicile where we wanted to. And the Netherlands was a very natural because it had a, it had the same exact feel and laws and philosophical as Pennsylvania did. So from our perspective, we said we had always been a stakeholder company. With that being said, over the last eight years, we returned 30% KGAR to our shareholders, total shareholder return. I've said a well-run company is does great by its shareholders, and we've continued to do that. I think there is a lot of noise and a lot of the rhetoric was, well, 
if you don't, if shareholders don't come first and the dollar amount doesn't come first, then you know Wall Street has frowned upon that. Right. And right. that short term driving for the quarter is, you know, I think is going to continue to be unhealthy for our country. I hope that people continue to step back and say, you know, you can't build a great company quarter by quarter. And, you know, I was looking at some interesting statistics that in the 70s, the average people held stock for an average of eight years. Today, it's six months. And That's an average number. And, you know, I think that speaks volumes to what's incentivizing corporate behavior. They